So you mentioned hard war policy as a policy embraced by U.S. military officials, especially against Native Americans, and that's something that, uh, when you think of Mark Grimsley's work, that's something that starts in the middle of the Civil War, where we're going to really going to show the Southern states, we're going to punish civilian populations, um, and we do, and you indicate that we do have a pro-Confederate population in parts of New Mexico territory, but it's not necessarily geared towards na towards that pro-Confederate population when we talk hard war, it's Native Americans. So how much is this an outgrowth of Civil War policies that Native Americans are subjected to hard war policies? Or how much is this a continuation of already 20, 30, 40 years of established um, military policy of the United States? I think that's a great point. And I think it is part of that long durée of, of Indian War. And mm -hmm. I think that James Carleton would have loved to bring Navajos and Apaches into a general battle. He would have loved to be able to like fight them in a battle of Valverde or Gloria de Pass and have a definitive military victory. Um, but he knew uh, that that was going to be impossible because of the nature of these native societies. They were very spread out over huge expanses um, of desert and it was, you would try to pursue them and they just would not, Sure. They were not playing ball, basically. Even though um, you do have the Apache Pass incident. Yes. Which yes. kind of is a little bit of a pitch battle, but not yes. quite there. Yeah, it is. I mean, that and that is a battle that reveals how important um, re natural resources are mm -hmm. in, this, yes. in this region for controlling the entire region. So, you know, Apache Pass, Apache Spring was the only water source within 60 miles. We want a very important mail route and transportation route uh, between the Rio Grande and California. And Carlton's men needed to take it and take control of it um, in order to sustain their march along the way. And of course, they're in the middle of Chiricahua Apache territory um, and the Chiricahua Apaches are going to assert their sovereignty in that space um, as they had. So you are, um, what you're seeing more of though is that the Civil War armies here were much larger. Mm -hmm. than the frontier armies had been. Um, there were larger concentrations of them. Uh, their military power was obvious. Mm -hmm. um, they had lots of cannons with them, which mm -hmm. was not al always the case in some frontier garrisons, um, where they would bring them like into, <laughs> into battle. Um, and so that made it a kind of interesting, that was a, a moment where you see a kind of traditional pattern of warfare with right. Indian wars and in, in the before the war, um, kind of collide with a with civil war circumstances mm -hmm. um, of concentration. So, um, and you know, with the Navajo conflict, Carleton basically says to Carson, Carson's very reluctant to start a winter campaign against the Navajos, and Carleton basically just says, "Go, do it. I am ordering you to do it to march mm -hmm. on Canyon de Chelly in the middle of winter." Um, and they had already set up with vigorous warfare. Um, so conditions of vulnerability for the Navajo. So they had already gone through, they had burned um, a huge number of acres of corn that Navajos had cultivated um, to feed them through the winter. They had already scattered them into areas where they were not used to being um, during this season. And so they were already vulnerable. And so when Carson marched his first New Mexico uh, soldiers into that space and into Navajo territory, some resisted, some fled, 